go ahead and get started. So welcome to this session on findings from the work support strategies evaluation. Uh, we will have two speakers and a discussant, and then we'll open it up for questions. I'm Hilary Forster with the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. I'll be moderating. Uh, so our first speaker will be Heather Hahn, who is a senior fellow in the Urban Institute's Center on Labor, Human Services, and Population. She co-leads the Work Support Strategies Evaluation. She's a national TANF expert with two decades of experience conducting research on the wide range of programs and policies related to the well-being of children and families, including TANF, SNAP, and other supports for low-income families, as well as education, labor, and other policy issues. And before joining the Urban Institute, she was an assistant director for education, workforce, and income security issues at the US Government Accountability Office. We'll then hear from Julia Isaacs, who is a senior fellow at the Urban Institute and plays a lead role in the Work Support Strategies Initiative. Prior to uh, coming to the Urban Institute, she served six years as director of the Division of Data and Technical Analysis at the US Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. She also served as a fellow at the Brookings Institution and was at the Congressional Budget Office. And lastly, we'll have Jennifer Wagner, who is a senior policy analyst with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, specializing in Medicaid eligibility and enrollment and opportunities to coordinate the delivery of Medicaid and SNAP. Previously, she was an associate director with the Illinois Department of Human Services, where she was responsible for SNAP and TANF policy. Uh, more details on their bios are available in um, the mobile app and on our website, and uh, I will turn it over to them. All right, good afternoon. In the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna try to give you an overview of the entire Work Support Strategies Initiative and Evaluation. So I just want to uh, warn you, this is be very high level, but uh, for those of you who are interested in all the details that are behind this high level overview, there are several publications on the Urban Institute website under the Work Support Strategies Evaluation where you can find um, much more rich information. So today's just an introduction. I want to start off by looking at the title slide, which is not quite up yet. <laughs> Aha, I made it happen. All right, so take a look at this picture. This is a stock photo, but it could be any uh, typical social service office. It looks pretty crowded. The people look a bit uncomfortable. They expect to wait a long time. Someone has her knitting out. Several of them have their paperwork in hand. They may have taken the day off to spend the day in the office, the day off, day off from work, um, or some time off from work to be at this office. They may have needed to find childcare for their children, or their children may be with them while they wait. Maybe they're applying for SNAP today, and they'll have to come back tomorrow or next week or go to a different office to apply for Medicaid. This is the picture of what the Work Support Strategies Initiative is trying to address. The inefficient processes that use outdated technology and old-fashioned business processes are burdensome both to the families who are seeking support, but also to the, the states and counties, um, to their social service agencies that are trying to deliver the services. So the Work Support Strategies Initiative is funded by the Ford Foundation, the Open Society Foundation, Annie E. Casey Foundation, Kresge, and J.P. Morgan Chase, and is a cooperative effort of the Urban Institute, CLASP, and the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. The goals of the Work Support Strategies Initiative are to improve families' well-being by increasing their enrollment in the full package of work supports to help states deliver those benefits more effectively and efficiently, and then to share those lessons learned to inform state and federal policies. There were six states that were competitively selected to be the work support strategy states. They are Colorado, Idaho, Illinois, North Carolina, Rhode Island, and South Carolina. 
And these states received grants, expert technical assistance, and peer learning to help them reform, modernize, align, and integrate the systems delivering work support programs intended to increase families' well-being and stability. The states each included SNAP, Medicaid, and child care assistance, and some of the states included other programs as well. So what changes did they make? A first fundamental change is an increased focus on customer service. The WSS states were committed to respecting their customers' time and dignity, and they strive to take the customer's point of view to find ways to make the process easier for them. So rather than providing benefits just within the federally required 30 days or 45 days, in many cases, clients are able to receive work supports on the same day that they apply for those benefits. All WSS states also expanded the options for clients to apply online or by phone so that fewer of them need to come in and sit in those uncomfortable chairs in the office. As one Idaho official said, families don't care if we meet the federal standard. They care how quickly they get access to benefits. So a set of concrete changes that they made were around policy changes. The WSS states made several policy changes to streamline family access to SNAP, child care, and Medicaid. For example, to streamline SNAP operations, state policy changes reduced the use of face-to-face -face interviews. They simplified eligibility and verification requirements. They lengthened the certification periods. And similar changes were made in child care programs and in Medicaid, uh, consistent with the ACA changes as well. And they not only made policy changes within individual programs to streamline access, but they also sought to align policies across the work support programs to reduce the administrative burdens on families as well as workers when families are eligible for more than one program. For example, some states established cross-program review processes for new policies. So if you're going to make a change in Medicaid, they'd talk with the policy people in SNAP and say, what are the implications of this change for SNAP? They aligned the timing of benefit redetermination so a family could renew benefits for two or more programs at the same time and not have to come back to the office a separate time. They used electronic data to auto-enroll SNAP recipients into Medicaid when that was appropriate. So by streamlining and aligning the policies, they reduced the need for duplicative efforts and duplicative paperwork. A second set of concrete changes they made were around technology. Each of the WSS states implemented new technology or updated existing technology to help deliver services more efficiently. When WSS started in 2011, several states' eligibility systems were those very outdated green screen computers um, they, these so-called legacy systems um, were slow, inefficient, and cumbersome to reprogram. If you made a policy change, it was really hard to change the computer to match that new policy. And as a result, clients needed to provide the same paper documentation multiple times in multiple, for multiple programs. So the states used technology to automate some administrative tasks and improve their efficiency. And they also saw that technology could support efforts to improve the cross-program integration that was so central to this effort. So if the technology allows information to be shared more easily across the government departments and across the programs. Again, you reduce the need for families to bring multiple documents to multiple offices. So in addition to changing their, um, before I go that one, one more thing on technology, um, in addition to changing the eligibility systems, they also introduced online applications and web portals so people had access without coming to the office. And they, uh, all of the WSS states implemented some kind of lobby management technology to maximize the efficiency and minimize the wait times in the lobbies. Um, they also had some electronic data verification and document imaging systems. So we're really trying to make the most of technology. And then a third kind of concrete change was around business process changes. All WSS states made changes to their business processes, updating their methods for greeting customers, accepting applications, making eligibility determinations, processing changes and renewals. Frontline workers were very often involved in this process, sometimes literally mapping with, with uh, whiteboards or post-its what was their current process, identifying more of what the roadblocks were 
and testing out new ways that would be more efficient. Uh, as a result of these, the states changed their lobbies in the local offices, in part using the technology I just mentioned. They shifted the work and how the work was allocated across the workforce. They eliminated unnecessary steps in the process and then made other changes to streamline and simplify their operations. And again, they didn't just do this for uh, individual programs, but used it to integrate the business processes across programs. So for example, to have a, a single interview for both SNAP and Medicaid. And they had a focus on making sure that customers seeking assistance for multiple programs had no wrong door. No matter where they started, they could seek access, they could get access to the full package of benefits for which they were eligible. So they were making policy, technology, and business process changes uh, individually, but then they also found that changes of one type went hand in hand with changes of another type. So they needed to think about the interplay of the policy, technology, and business processes as they implemented their visions for service delivery. So for example, the state policy staff usually were involved in design decisions on the new eligibility systems to make sure that technology was consistent with the existing or planned policies. And the policy staff were also involved in the business process changes to make, the bus make sure that the business processes and the policies were compatible. And another example, in Rhode Island, they developed a single computer system that had all the social service programs in that one computer system. And once they did that, that facilitated a business process that was more integrated. So they needed to think about all, all of these at once. So that's a lot of changes. What did it take to make those changes? As Many of you here I know are in state government and you know it is very difficult to make meaningful and lasting improvements in the delivery of social services. It's very hard work. There is frequent turnover at the highest levels of gov state government. Um, there are complex and entrenched bureaucracies. There's limited funding, which often means hiring freezes. There are lengthy processes for making changes to laws and regulations. And those are just the internal pressures. Then there are external pressures from stakeholders, the federal government, the courts, the state legislature. And all of these make it really difficult to make a focused change uh, that makes a difference and lasts. Despite these many challenges, the WSS states strategically seized the opportunity that this initiative gave them and other opportunities that they saw to overcome these challenges and move their states in new directions. And once again, I'm gonna gloss over a lot of the, the details in this time, but there is much more information in the reports on our website. So one of the things that it takes to make change is leadership and vision. Each of the WSS states had active leadership of high-level agency officials. The leaders driving the WSS changes typically were the uh, directors of the state health and human service agencies, but the cabinet secretaries also had periodic and direct involvement in this process. They made not only the practical, provided not only practical leadership, but also demonstrated a passion for the changes and the passion for the vision um, that these changes were, were pointing toward. So a, a Colorado leader said, you know, most people go into this work because they have some sense of a higher desire to help. And so reminding staff of that mission motivated and refueled them for doing the concrete hard changes um, that needed to take place. The WSS leaders also persevered in the face of competing priorities and emphasized continuous improvement. This work is not done in a day and it's never really done. So they needed to have this orientation of continuous improvement and kept their focus on the priorities of simplifying and aligning policies and business processes to improve the delivery of work supports, really motivated by this strong vision of reducing unnecessary work for staff and making a measurable difference in customers' lives. No leader, though, can make change on his or her own. So they needed the cooperation of a large number of entities. For one, uh, because separate state agencies and offices often oversee Medicaid, SNAP, and child care, to make integrated changes across these programs required cooperating and integrating 
strategies across these agencies. States, counties, <laughs> counties and, and localities are also very important in working with the, the state uh, because they implement the policies, but they also needed to be involved in designing them so that they made sense um, to counties and localities. Same for frontline workers and supervisors. They needed to be involved in designing the changes and implementing the changes, and this often required training uh, for supervisors. As the business processes changed and supervisors may have been focused before on more on people and now they needed to be focused more on process or, or vice versa, that training needed to happen. Community stakeholders and families were also involved in these efforts in some of the states. And then federal agencies are also important partners in this process. Some states spent considerable effort attempting to connect with the federal agencies administering SNAP and Medicaid to discuss where the federal policies appeared to diverge and to figure out what was under the federal requirements and what opportunities states had to make changes within the federal guidelines. They also needed a, a concrete strategy for realizing this vision. As one state project manager said, there are so many goals and timelines that if you don't put structure on it, you'll spin out of control. So the structure of the WSS initiative required that states approach their goal with a very deliberate strategy. The initiative began with a planning year during which states defined their visions, they reviewed data to identify the opportunities for improvement and guide their decisions, and they were encouraged to develop integrated approaches to their changes in policy, technology, and business process. Throughout the initiative, states managed their efforts with dedicated project managers whose job was to focus on these changes and they had dedicated cross-agency work groups focused on this effort. They provided extensive staff training. And these concrete strategies helped the states make practical progress toward their visions. And then last but not least, using data for planning and accountability. Throughout the initiative, the WSS management TA teams were encouraging and assisting states in their efforts to collect, analyze, and use data to assist in their policy development and decision making. So some states were more successful than others. Doing this data uh, analysis requires technological capacity. It also requires human capacity for identifying the data, tracking it, understanding and reacting to the new information as it comes. All of the states encountered challenges to varying degrees in defining and accessing meaningful metrics for their, their changes and interpreting the data that they have. But they did provide data, and we're about to hear in a, just another minute um, from Julia about some of what that data show. With financial and technical assistance from the WSS initiative, states made progress toward their goals of streamlining access to work support programs and strengthening families. Their experiences certainly highlight the challenges, the considerable challenges involved in making lasting and meaningful large-scale change, but they also showed that meaningful change in service delivery in state bureaucracies is possible. So they can serve as models and advisors to other states who are pursuing similar goals, and they can, their experiences can also help federal agencies see how their own policies and practices can facilitate or hinder the streamlined and integrated delivery of work supports. So I'm gonna turn it over to Julia to show the results that we have. Thank you, Heather. Um, when my slide comes up, you'll see I have the same picture because I am doing part two. Um, oh, there's my slide. Um, improving the efficiency of benefit delivery outcomes. So as Heather said, I'm gonna focus on the results. Um, and I do wanna thank the funders and our partners and all the people that worked on this. And I wanna give a particular shout out to the state and local staff from the six states who provided the administrative data without which I could not be showing you all these fun graphs. So seeing results. And I'm going to show you results in three areas. First, I'm gonna show uh, faster delivery of benefits after application. 
Second, I will show that they had some mixed success in reducing churn at time of program renewal. And the third area I will look at is, will show mixed evidence on their ability to improve the workflow. And I have some caveats about these findings. First of all, I haven't finished writing the report, or we haven't finished writing the report. And so the findings you see are preliminary and under review. Of course, I see them in my app, so I don't know how, how secret they are, but we do say do not cite them. Um, our report should be coming out um, September 2016. So you're, this is not hot off the press, it's before it goes to press. The other caveat, I'll just mention, I'm not going to try to cover the entire work support strategies. I'm focusing on that efficiency of benefit delivery, and we have other reports, including one coming out the end of this month, about things like expanding access and how the states were successful and able to get more people who are jointly eligible for SNAP and Medicaid to get both um, of those benefits. But let me move to the first of my three areas, speeding up delivery of benefits after application. I think it's obvious why you'd want to do this. It helps needy clients get aid faster. And the first slide is one of what I would show as our success slides in that it shows a substantial increase in SNAP same-day service. I don't know how many people here are familiar with the term same-day service. It's when you walk into the welfare office and you walk out with your benefits, your EBT card, in, in this case of SNAP, in the same day. And you can see a doubling in Colorado, more than doubling from 15 to 33 percent, nearly tripling in Rhode Island, a big increase in Illinois. Idaho did not increase very much, but they were already starting at 71 percent of their SNAP applicants got benefits the day they walked into the office. Um, the two states that are not on this slide, South Carolina didn't track same-day service, but it tracked what percent got within 10 days, and that percentage went up from 36 to 40 percent. So we also see some improvements in getting benefits out quickly. The sixth state, now North Carolina, is the exception. They had a technology rollout that actually slowed down benefit delivery for some period of time, including the time that we're um, tracking here. To show a little more about same-day service, I'm looking more closely here at Colorado, the percentage of SNAP um, applicants getting same-day service over time. And that top line is the eight largest counties that got an intensive um, assistance in business process redesign by working with a contractor. And they're the ones that had more increase in same-day service. And you also, if you can see the shaded area when the BPR was rolling out, that's the same period that the same-day service went up. So we see this as pretty strong evidence that the same-day service increased because of the business process redesign. And there was some increase in the state, the, the many smaller and other counties that didn't work with the contractor that did have some increase in same-day service, but not at the same level. I have a similar slide here from Rhode Island. Um, there was one jump up in same-day service early on when they made it a priority and did some um, of their own business process redesign. And then they did a much broader office redesign and in July of 2014, and their same-day service in SNAP increased considerably. And you also get to see TANF and child care. It's harder to give same-day service if a client has to see, in, in Rhode Island, TANF, you have to see both the the eligibility person and your employment plan person, so it's hard to do same day service, but you do see some increases there. It wasn't just that they got, I mean, you have to think of people getting benefits right away, but then the other end, what if it's been 30 days and you haven't gotten your benefits? That really can drive your average days, those really high ones, and we do see a decrease in average days. Again, um, SNAP has the most um, data, so I'm showing the SNAP data. In, uh, Idaho, they were only, they're already at 2.4, but they reduced to 1.6 average days to get your benefits. And you can see the other states, and South Carolina is one of my states here, the other four states also had a decrease in average days. Now this is looking at sort of an early quarter of data from the states and a late quarter. What it hides is that sometimes there was a negative period in the in, in the middle. In this case, average days up is bad. Um, this is Illinois where and this was not unusual, not just Illinois, but where you, you roll out a new technology, and if you do it at the same time as ACA, when you have an influx of Medicaid applications, you can have experience of your average days of SNAP application processing going from 20 days to more than 35 days. In this case, they recovered fairly quickly. Um, the, it took longer to recover in Medicaid. Um, we have some. We could show similar slides from South Carolina again, where the Medicaid 
took, that sometimes there are big problems when you roll out new technology systems. So while we see an improvement in um, benefit delivery, particularly increased same-day service, we do want to point out that sometimes things got worse before they got better, especially during rollouts of technology. Now, I didn't show additional data that will be in the report, but we did not see as much improvement consistently in the federal measure of SNAP timeliness. The Food and Nutrition Service um, tracks whether you get your benefits within 30 days or within seven days for certain cases. And states didn't put as much emphasis on that. And I, I like this quote from an Idaho official. People would come into lobbies because they were hungry now, not 30 days from now, which captures maybe one reason why the, the increase was in same day service. My second area is reducing churn at the time of program renewal. Um, let me just define what I mean by churn. It's when a family leaves benefits and comes back within a short period, and I'm going to use 90 days. You could measure churn after 60 days if you wanted. And churn, a lot of that churn that happens is the family is actually still eligible during that 60 or 90 days, but they didn't fill out a form or it was not put in the computer correctly and somehow their case closed, they went to the grocery store, their card didn't work, they go back in and reapply and get back on. There also is churn when you lose eligibility. Maybe your earnings went up and you lose eligibility, your earnings go down and you get back on. So there's more than one type of churn. Um, whatever type of churn it is, if you can reduce it, that obviously helps the client. And it helps the agency because processing uh, initial application can cost um, like um, twice, two to three times as much as a recertification. And so if you can reduce that, you can improve, improve agency costs. Now, I could spend 10 minutes talking about how to measure churn, but I'm not going to except to say it's hard to conceptualize it and there's longitudinal data requirements. Dottie Rosenbaum did a nice paper on lessons churn that shows three different data measures. I'm going to use one of her three measures, which is churn at the time of renewal. You can see in this slide if 10,000 cases come up for renewal, 4,000 close, 2,600 reopen, that's what I would call a 26% um, churn rate, where the denominator is all those up for renewal, and the numerator is those that reapplied. And only two of our six states were able to give us churn data every month for a continuous period of time, so I just have results from Idaho and Rhode Island. In Idaho, there were reductions in Medicaid and SNAP churn, but their child care churn sort of fluctuated and was actually higher at the last quarter than the first quarter we looked at. Rhode Island, there was a reduction in the number of child care cases that actually churned, but their SNAP churn increased and they didn't track Medicaid. So up and down in different states and no data in four states, that's why I say mixed success. But let me show you one of the areas where there was dramatic success. This is in Idaho where they had a dramatic reduction in Medicaid churn. They actually started fairly low. Um, they uh, had what is that, 7% at the beginning, which is quite low for a churn rate. And what they did, as, as Heather talked about, you can align things. So they had their SNAP cases redetermine, and then, like maybe, I don't know, it's a month later or some period later, have their Medicaid cases, and then you can use all the SNAP data and automatically renew people for Medicaid without the client doing anything. And then there's no procedural churn because there's no procedure the client has to follow. Um, and that's the big reduction there. They also, when ACA came in, they, I think they reduced some verifications, like getting rid of an assets test, and so there's even less that had to be done, and they got their churn rate down to, it's like 0.2%. It's less than half a percent. It's a tiny churn rate, so that's a big success. I now want to jump to Rhode Island, where they had um, child care churn, and their actual rate of, of people that churned off, and this is both for procedural reasons or because you changed jobs and, and, and lost eligibility for child care. It's quite high, it's like 30% or more, and it did not change over the period, but if you look at the blue bars, you see the number of cases up for renewal went down pretty steadily, even though their caseload was actually going up at this time. And so the number of cases that churned, if you sort of in your mind multiply that red by the blue, would be going down, the actual number of cases that churned. And the reason is that they deliberately lengthened their certification period to 12 months, which you, if you follow childcare, know is now the new law. 
They did it actually early on, and the caseworkers didn't initially implement it because they couldn't believe people really wanted to give people childcare for 12 months, but with more training, they realized that was a new policy, and as that happened, fewer cases came up for renewal, and so there were fewer cases of churn. So you can reduce churn without changing your churn rate, just have fewer people coming up for renewal because by lengthening the certification period, which is helpful particularly in childcare where you want continuity of care. Okay, so that was a good story from Rhode Island. I'm now gonna share one of the, well, one of the areas where they did not have an improvement. They had a fairly high churn rate in SNAP, about 30%, and so they decided to do a statewide recertification unit where people would just work on recertifying people, trying to reduce the number of procedural closures and reduce, therefore, the churn. And in fact, as you can see, the churn rate actually went up over that period and continued going up. Um, they, there are things like the SNAP unit was never fully um, staffed, and so it was, there weren't enough people to, to complete all the recertifications. They also, Rhode Island was not yet a paperless office, and so to have a centralized unit doing it, but then people would walk into the local office and the cases would be in two different places, they're not electronic. So I'm not saying that a statewide recertification unit is not a good idea, I'm saying in this case, it did not reduce churn. So they looked at these data, and at this point they've disbanded that unit and are trying to reduce churn now back through the local office. Okay, let me move to my third area, which is improving lobby management and back-end processing. And I have a picture I actually have to thank Heather for. I think this is a picture from Illinois, um, a before and after. And I put this partly to show you evidence comes in different forms. Um, also, the importance of a pre and post. Unfortunately, with my lobby management data, that was very rare. We do two waves of client experience surveys in one state. They'd both be before they made the change. In another state, it was both after they made the change. Or People put in a new lobby management system, and you have lots of good data after it's in. So I am going to show you um, data, but there's not much more data than what I'm going to show you. So we ha don't have a lot of data in this area. This does show where we had a wave, two waves of client data in um, Illinois. And it's September 2014 and March 2015, and there were some changes in business process redesign, particularly as you working with SNAP um, expedited clients, which are those with very little income that are supposed to be served within um, seven days. So the waiting time went down from 52 minutes to 38 minutes on average is our estimate based on what clients reported. At the same time, the number of office visits went down from 1.5 to 1.1 office visits. This is among the expedited. Um, that average of 1.1 visits includes those that didn't come in at all. Like they had more than a fifth of their clients did all of the SNAP intake without coming into the office. They did this by had an increase in online applications. They also called people up, cold calling to do a interview where they didn't schedule a call. They just called the person up and said, can you do the SNAP interview right now? And a number of people could. And so they were able to, I think the reduction in client waiting time is probably because there were fewer people in the office. Um, and client satisfaction went up, as particularly among the expedited. <laughs> now in Idaho, the QFlow is the name of their lobby management system, and it was statewide, but was only in the Boise office area that there was Excel data tracking the wait times beforehand. So I was able to compare, I only have two and a half months of data, and it's Excel spreadsheet, but it looks like an average of about 25 minutes before they put in QFlow, and then the first 12 to 13 months of QFlow, more like 15 minutes of wait time. Now this is not just SNAP applicants, this is anybody coming into the lobby for any program to hand something in, to apply, whatever. And then it went back up during they had open enrollment for their state-based marketplace. But if you ignore that, it does look like QFlow um, did help improve wait times in Idaho. They also, in the, in the Boise area, they also um, track the service time. Now this is how much time, not the client is waiting in the office, but the, the worker spends either with the client or on stuff that comes in not through the, off, not through the lobby, but you know, the mail and all kinds of, whatever kind of transaction they're doing that also seems to have gone down. Um, so it appears service time is faster, but again, there are different sources of data for pre and post, so that's um, important to know. A third 
um, state, or actually this is a county of Larimer County, was able to provide me data where they tracked the number of documents processed per worker before and after their business process redesign. And you can see that it's higher after um, business process redesign. It's not perfect data because if you get more applicant caseload increase, you have more documents, but the people who provided the data were pretty convinced that actually their business process design had helped their workers be more efficient. Still, when I do an overall um, conclusion, what you're not seeing is all the states that I don't have data from, but I, I end up concluding there's pretty mixed evidence on improving workflow. There's better evidence on reducing client wait times. In addition to the administrative data I've shown, there were a number of interviews where people said our, our lobby, we're not locking our doors to keep clients out because it's too overflowing. We used to do that six times a month and now we don't do it at all. Um, that type of data, it seems that client wait times did generally go down when people um, focused on lobby management. There really wasn't good evidence on whether the time workers spend on each task went down. Some people talked about it going up after new computer systems rolled out. Some talked about it going down. And so I think we're going to conclude no clear trend there. So my recap, we had saw faster delivery of benefits after application in five of six states. We saw mixed success in reducing churn with some programs being successful and some not even within the same state, and that's based on two states with data and really mixed evidence on improving workflow, limited data from one state and new lo two localities that had pre and post data, more s evidence on reduced client times, and really no clear trend on worker service times. I'd like to thank you and be happy to answer questions, but first we're gonna hear from Jennifer, who was in one of those six states. Okay, so um, I don't have slides because I'm here to more tell the story of WSS from the perspective of a participant, but really a beneficiary of the product uh, of the project. Um, I now work for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, but I was the leader of the WSS initiative in Illinois for about five years. Um, but to be clear, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Illinois Department of Human Services. Just to get that out there. Um, I started at DHS in February of 2010, and I had come from the advocacy world. And it was very clear right away that there were changes that needed to be made. There were changes to policy, to business processes, to operations that needed to be made. But myself and my team were trying to look at these things in our free time each day. And that amounted to one to two minutes on a good day that we could actually think about these initiatives because there were so many crises coming at us constantly from every direction. And in fall of that year, this opportunity arose. And I should have counted, I think 13 or 17 different people sent me the WSS RFP saying, this is perfect for Illinois. And it really looked like it was written for us because it so much met the needs that we were facing. Now, the money that was involved in it is small when you look at a state budget. Um, the funding for the first year planning grant, $250,000. I think our budget at DHS alone was around $6 billion of state funds or something. But it wasn't about the money. It was about the fact that we were able to use the, that amount of dedicated funds to hire staff dedicated to this project. And it might sound silly, but that allowed us to have meetings focused on this. And those meetings had agendas and there was follow-up, and all of those things that get lost in the chaos of everyday life, we were able to kind of have some attention to. It also provided some accountability. We had said, oh, we have to focus on this because we're accountable to a funder, and that allowed us to carve some time out of each day to look at it, and also got some high-level support from within the agency uh, and, and from the governor's office. And again, the first year was planning, but it wasn't that planning where it's like a strategic plan, let's look at in 10 years what we're gonna do and then it's gonna be put on a shelf and never actually uh, followed up on. So we used the planning year in a very practical way. We were testing things, we were looking at them as we went and, and being agile as much as a state government can be agile. So we looked at four main areas. We looked at policy, technology, data, and business processes. In policy, we were very lucky. We already started as an integrated system. We had SNAP and Medicaid together with TANF. We had decent communications with childcare, although that was a place that we were able to definitely improve. Um, but we looked at opportunities to align the policies, and what we found, in fact, was in most cases, the most restrictive policy was restricted by federal government 
regulations. And in order to actually align policies, we would have to make more other programs more restrictive. And so in that case, we chose not to align them. In that case, not having them connected was, was okay. But we did have opportunities to do things like get rid of unnecessary forms, to really look at what was happening on the ground and the policies that were influencing that and what needed to be changed. When we talked to the local offices, there was this entity that was frequently brought up called Springfield, our capital. Springfield told us we had to do this. And we actually looked into it, and yes, Springfield said that in 1985, but they then repealed that, you know, six, seven, eight years ago. And so to really kind of make that connection between policy and what was happening on the ground to make things more efficient. A huge area for us was technology. Um, this was when ACA passed and we needed new technology system. Um, the systems we were using was, were older than I was, um, older than a lot of our staff. And we had the federal funding available to actually take this on this initiative, which was a huge opportunity, but also a huge challenge. Doesn't matter how much you pay those vendors, you still have to have tons of your state staff dedicated to designing, testing, and managing this new eligibility system. But it also provided us opportunities to do things like develop a call center. Um, as Julia mentioned, a lot of those SNAP applications were able to be uh, processed without people coming into the office because they could actually call a centralized call center, apply, be interviewed over the phone, and have a decision made that same day. That was revolutionary for us. It also allowed for submission of electronic documents with applications. The paper flow, the paper flow through the mail, through people coming into offices to drop off, phone calls, did you get my paperwork, what's going on, how that paper actually flows through the office, that is one of the biggest places of pain in a system. Leads to churn, leads to problems, leads to questions, leads to traffic in the local office. So being able to implement technology that allows those documents to be submitted online, or where a lot of states are going to actually having mobile apps so that you can take a picture of that document and submit it electronically, can be simple but revolutionary. One of the things technology did right away when we implemented our new eligibility system in fall of 2013 is it allowed us to move applications around electronically. We had over 100 offices, and sometimes one office would be understaffed and overwhelmed more so than the other offices. And we had heads of the offices literally meeting on the side of the road after work to pass over boxes of documents for that other office to process. And that worked, kind of, but it was obviously very cumbersome and inefficient. So even having the electronic applications come through and being able to say, okay, X office, I need you to take these thousand applications. Y office, you help with these applications, was revolutionary, especially around the chaos of ACA implementation. Looking at data, we had lots of data. We had thousands of pages of reports that were literally printed out and mailed to each office around the state. We also had an online system that was called Mobius, and I don't know if this is the origin, but this is how I thought of it. You know a Mobius strip, which is that strip of paper with one twist that connects, and it's actually endless. There's no beginning, there's no end, it just kind of keeps going and going. That was our data situation. We had these reports, but it wasn't manageable. It wasn't something that people looked at. There are a couple of things like snap timeliness, we made everyone look at that, but all the other stuff, hmm, this is nice, and it got you know stacked, filed away somewhere. So we created a dashboard that brought together some of these key issues, looking at procedural denials, looking at churn, looking at even just application volume and timeliness by office, by region, statewide. And by boiling all of that information down to a single page, that really helped the offices focus in on what's important and you know, get some of the noise out of the way. Now, in classic state government processes, we created that dashboard, got people excited about it, and then the guy who programmed it retired and we had nobody to maintain it. But that's right, I mean, it still created this more better culture looking at data. For us, business, uh, business processes were a major area of focus. Um, some of the philosophy in the local offices were a little bit off as far as efficiencies. You know, I'd ask an office, okay, what is your process for looking at expedited SNAP and making sure that those applications are identified right off the bat? And they said, we are on top of that. Every single application goes through this manager for them to review and determine if it's expedited. That's not efficient when you're getting thousands and thousands of applications a month. How can we make it so that it's reviewed at an initial point and that there isn't some bottleneck throughout the process? So really having those conversations, mapping the process, having people look at these with a critical eye and finding opportunities made a huge difference. 
I really admire Julie and Heather's attempts to measure the results and really look at this, because I know we have some researchers in the room, and one of the principles is you want to control for external variables. How do you control for ACA implementation, Medicaid expansion, implementation of new systems, which sometimes occurred all at the same time? As some of those graphs demonstrated, that blew things up for a while. Um, but there's a lot of intangible things that came out of this project that isn't clearly reflected in the data, but are things that are going to make a huge difference um, in, in the years to come. So some of the intangibles and why it's harder to measure what actually happened during this project. The first pilot office we chose in Illinois was a moderate office. It was doing okay. It wasn't our worst by any means. We wanted to start a place where we thought we could kind of, you know, get some traction and get things implemented. That office did not have bad numbers to start out. But not all applications that were submitted made it through the process. We heard from community partners and others that a lot of applications were lost along the way. So the numbers look good, but weren't actually good. And so at the end, the metrics didn't change a lot after we changed the business processes there, except that all applications were being processed. And that's not something that comes up in one of these charts, but that is something that makes a huge difference to low-income families seeking these benefits. Another intangible thing is that the state started to measure and discuss these things. I don't think we had even talked about churn. I don't think we knew that term before this project started. You knew what a procedural denial was, but there was no concept of how impactful that actually was. There was a whole lot of culture change that we had to implement in the offices. There were a few um, WSS-isms that came out of the project, things that people said during the project, and you heard them and they made sense to you, but it wasn't until you actually lived it that you said, oh, wait, that's, that's right. And one of these was culture eats strategy for lunch. And that was so true. You could have this beautifully mapped out strategy by central office, but unless you got the staff on the ground to really buy into the vision to accept these changes, there was, there was no hope. There was a lot of skepticism that we were making these business process changes in order to reduce staff. The fact was the staff had reduced first. We were looking at caseloads of 2,700 per worker. Okay, 2,700 families per worker, which left each caseworker less than 45 minutes per family per year. So that reduction had happened. We were just trying to adapt to it, not justify further reductions in staffing. What we were looking to reduce was over-verification. How many things need to be verified? How many things need to be verified by policy? Where can we use electronic documents or um, collateral contacts in order to reduce over-verification, which could lead us to same-day service? One of the things we did, and, and data helped us a lot with this, was we mandated cold calling for expedited. And that means that when an application for SNAP comes in, it looks like it's expedited eligible, instead of sending out an appointment notice, pick up the phone and try to call that customer. Many staff did not believe this was possible. Oh, they give us bad phone numbers, they don't answer the phone, this never works. Well, we said, okay, you have to do it for expedited. We actually had data in the new eligibility system that showed a success rate of around 70% for expedited cold calling. And all that back and forth that's taken out of the system, mailing a notice, people not being able to come, calling, trying to reschedule, all of that messiness was taken out. We were able to actually reach people and process their application. And that led to stories. And stories can be way more effective even than data. We had one caseworker say they got an online application at 3 o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. At 3.45, they called that customer did the interview, and processed their case. And that feeling the caseworker had when the customer was called, when they were reached out to immediately and got that initial assistance of SNAP, that changed that person. That made them believe in this process. And the more they shared that with their coworkers, the more impact this had moving forward. So when we were measuring churn, looking at procedural denials, it, it made a huge difference, and just talking about these different data made a difference. We also focused a lot on communication. Um, just sharing the challenges, letting people know what is to come, telling them why we're doing what we're doing. Another WSSism, figure out how much communication you need and multiply it times 10. Sounded good at first, but we lived that. We found that that was actually, um, actually huge. So we had leadership institutes where we brought everybody together. We had monthly coffee chats, which were webinars speaking to the, um, the staff about what was going on. And what staff really reacted to was the fact that we were trying to do something positive. 
their lives, a lot of state lives, are spent reacting to different crises. And there's no shortage of them. We had an office that the fire department was going to shut down because we had boxes of paperwork in the, in the aisles of the office. Not the picture you showed. That one was fine. This was a worse office that we almost had shut down. We had offices without heat or water. And that was, that was the good old days when Illinois had a budget. Imagine how things are right now. Yeah, not good. Um, so by making that vision and, and achieving quick wins, that was important. Many other administrations had come through with pretty promises of what they're gonna ha what's going to happen and what they're going to bring to the offices. But they then petered out. So we had to demonstrate right away that we were serious. And one of the best ways we did that was we were able to use the enhanced federal funding to get new computers. The staff were operating with computers that had about 512 megabytes of RAM. They couldn't open a PDF. They had to come in in the morning, turn on the computer, go make breakfast, have coffee, then come back and see if it had booted up. So that made a huge difference to their lives um, and showed that we were serious about what we were doing. So there was tons of value that this project brought to the state. A big part of it was hearing from other states and learning about their successes and challenges. We were inspired by what's possible. I mean, Idaho made us all look bad, you can see that. But we could, saw that it was possible that some state had actually achieved 72% same day processing, something to strive for. But we were also all very grateful to hear from each other and find the problems that we didn't have. I never fully appreciated how nice it was to be state administered and not county administered until I talked to my colleagues on WSS and the fact that we started with an integrated SNAP and Medicaid system. We also found un unexpected parallels. Illinois and Rhode Island truly connected. We had very, very similar situations um, with as far as our union staff, as far as our state administration, things like that. The one place we diverged was we had conversations about trying to actually connect with the staff and how we communicate, and their solution was they just brought everybody together a couple times a year. That's different when you have you know, a few hundred staff versus a few thousand, but still we were able to really connect. And the technical assistance we got from the national team was invaluable. Some of you have heard of strategy three, which allows you to take SNAP recipients and quickly enroll them in expanded Medicaid. We would have read that and said, oh, this is nice, and put it to the side without the assistance from the Center on Budget helping us actually draft the notice and get it implemented. And as a result, we had tens of thousands of newly eligible Medicaid enrollees that we were able to enroll like that, um, which was critical at a time when our system was going through crises. WSS also had conferences twice a year that brought together all these staff and gave us time away from the office to really think about where we have been, where we're going, challenges, opportunities. Um, and, and that made a lot of difference. That's time that you don't get, um, usually in state government. And having that network, knowing people from these other states that we could actually reach out to and collaborate with had a, had a huge impact. Just those exposures to other ideas and realizing where you're a little bit behind, where you're ahead, but more what's possible and that you're not alone in this journey. So overall, it was a tremendous opportunity and it's really gonna produce a lot of results for many years to come. This culture change of looking at data, of thinking about what can be done, that's not gonna produce immediate results, but it really is making a difference in these states. And fundamentally, this project gave staff on the front lines as well as policymakers a chance to do what they came to human services to do and really to help children and working families get the benefits they need to support their efforts. So thank you for it. Great, thank you all. We have time for questions now. Uh, we have three different mics in the room if folks would like to go up and ask a question. Hi, um, thank you so much. Um, I have a question. Heather, you mentioned um, these states being able to be models or advisors to other states, so is there a formal way that's going to happen or opportunities for the work support strategy states to um, help other states and follow up on that if states are having, how key is technology? So if states are not ready to make big systems change, um, either, you know, from the culture or financially, are they able to gain some of these lessons? Okay, so I'm gonna leave your second, your first question to Elizabeth, who's gonna answer it in a minute. Um, I think that the, even without technology change, there are changes you can make to policy, changes to make to business processes, changes to make about paying attention to data, um, lots of things that states can do 
that don't involve changing technology. Uh, and then for learning from the WSS uh, initiative and the evaluation, uh, like I said, there are reports on our website. But for something a little more dynamic, there is a learning community being developed. And Elizabeth is right there with the microphone who can tell us more about it. I really didn't set this up with Deborah, so thank you. <laughs> um, so CLASP is one of the three organizations that was partners in work support strategies. And we do have some funding to support a learning community that builds on it. Unfortunately, we're not able to do state grants at the level that Work Support Strategies did, so it will be a little bit more light touch. Um, but we really are interested in talking to people who are interested in doing this work and finding out what we could do that would be most helpful in learning from the states that have already done this under Work Support Strategies, as well as states that are doing similar work uh, on their own already and states that might want to. So. Um, if you stop by and give me your contact information, I promise we will be in touch with you. Hi, and uh, congratulations on the work you've done. Very impressive, and I know that uh, states are in much better shape because of what you've done. I'm, I'm curious, uh, this has been labeled, of course, work support strategies, I think quite rightly. And I think we'd all agree that uh, the changes that have been made in these programs uh, should feed into uh, better preparation for work, better ability to keep a job and advance in a job. Uh, has there been any information in these states about what uh, the customers have done in that regard? Uh, even anecdotally, have they told you that, uh, wow, your changes uh, enable me to quit being away from the job so much, and now I don't worry about being fired. Anything like that at all that would tell us uh, what the effects on their ability to remain successfully engaged in work or start work uh, from what you've seen? Yeah, of course, ideally we would have data on that. And I think early on we had some hopes, but we did not get to that level, at least at, a, at an administrative data perspective of being able to track the, you know, the. We did not get linked data with um, quarterly earnings. And I'm trying to think, Heather, if I'm thinking of any quotes from any states or if, if, if people had a sense, you know, we did go out and talk to the staff, both state and local staff, um, four or five times once a year. And I'm trying to think whether we had quotes that suggested. It, it was one of the original goals, but it, is not something that was as prominent when states talked about what was different. They talked about things like, you know, our lobby is less chaotic, and they focused on things that they could see more directly. And I guess maybe it's that even to the state and local staff, it's hard for them to see what's happening in people's lives. And so we did not get a lot of quotes about that either. Uh, yeah, and there is other research, including some of the research that happened at the very beginning of this um, initiative that establishes that link between when you are able to receive benefits and particularly the whole package of benefits for which you're eligible, how that can stabilize families and um, help them maintain work. Uh, this study, our data wasn't going quite that far. Um, in our client surveys though, we have just a couple of questions there about uh, the impact on the family of the change in the process. And so, you know, did you have to take time off of work to, to come here? Did you need to find childcare? Uh, and um, also, were you, was there an emergency in your life at the time that you were applying that if you got your benefits faster, would it have, would you have avoided that problem? You know, maybe you, applied and then you were evicted and if you had gotten your benefits the same day you wouldn't have been evicted. So our um, client experience surveys have a little bit of data on that. I know that's not anywhere near the, the scale of what you're asking about but that is what we have. And should I just mention because I have the I think that I have it correctly in my head that about we were in three states about 60 percent said that they did have some kind of hardship or emergency in the period between when they applied 
and when they got benefits, and about half of those, that's very rough, but maybe 30%, 25, 30% of, of all the applicants said that they had a, a, a hardship that could have been avoided if they got their benefits faster. I mean, that's the applicant's perception. Yeah, I've been trying to follow and clasp the learning community, but how long does the project actually formally go on? And uh, Jennifer mentioned that the culture change in Illinois will make it continue to happen, but how long does the six states continue to go on in the strategy? So those of us on the evaluation team are working very hard right now, but the project has formally, the, oh, December 2015 was the last, was the end, and it sort of was wrapping up September, September. so fall 2015, the project is, is over from, except for those of us evaluating it. Not over, over, but I mean the, the grants are over. The main part of the project is over. Yeah, Elizabeth was saying how, so, so things that people plan to do, I mean, Rhode Island also rolled out, oh, July 2000, is, is going to roll out. Um, so people are still rolling out things that they developed, um, and some of the policies they developed, they're still training workers on. So things are still reverberating, but they're not, we don't have conferences, we're not having the regular, the grant is over. Exactly, that's a hope. I think it's gonna make a difference for many years to come. Hi, I'm uh, Melissa Fordshaw from Washington State Department of Social and Health Services. I loved this panel, this was really great. And I, I, I do think that Washington's doing some, a, a lot of this similar work, you know, with dashboards and streamlining. And one thing, just while I've been at this conference, we've gotten a request um, from our state auditor's office to look into the possibility of using our sort of SNAP and our, my administration's um, data on employment and income for the purposes of determining MAGI and Medicaid and Medicaid in Washington is now handled by another agency. So I wonder, I, it sounded like uh, in Idaho they're using SNAP data for Medicaid verification. I wonder if you could say a little more about that and the pros and cons of, po and I, I'm, I'm not familiar with this, but post-enrollment verification versus pre-enrollment verification. I probably can't go very deep into the details. I can mention South Carolina also where they use SNAP to um, SNAP data to renew pe children on Medicaid. And then we had mentioned that in, I, in Idaho, my understanding, and I'm getting the second or third hand since I wasn't on the ground in Idaho, but is that it was, had to do with aligning. So you have aligning the dates of when you did your SNAP redetermination and when you did your Medicaid. And so you know, let's say the, the regulations say within X months, you can decide to do it a little sooner so that you get the, so you get them lined up. So the person doesn't come in in April and renew on Medicaid and come in July and renew on SNAP because you can't use that. So by aligning those dates was one of the additional pieces. But a lot of it then was electronic, that, you, that the, compute, the same computer system can read the SNAP data and the Medicaid. There actually are complexities, though, about that because a lot of complexities. Yeah, so there are a lot of great opportunities to align SNAP and Medicaid at application and renewal. And it's applicable to states that have integrated systems as well as separated systems. So there's express line eligibility for children. There's the strategy three option that's still available, taking SNAP data to enroll or at one time renew Medicaid. And then there's a new state plan option that was just uh, provided in August of last year that Louisiana is actually using. That is an ongoing option that states can use to enroll or renew Medicaid for SNAP recipients. And then there's also simple data short sharing. That's, of course, not as simple as it sounds, but having the Medicaid agency actually look at the SNAP data because SNAP income information is verified in an even more rigorous way than Medicaid, and so Medicaid can rely on that SNAP data. And one of the opportunities there is SNAP is usually looked at more often than Medicaid. So if every time SNAP data is updated at a renewal, Medicaid can actually be renewed early and pushed forward, so you never actually face a joint SNAP Medicaid renewal renewal or Medicaid only renewal. So I'd be happy to talk with you in more details about those opportunities.
I'll add one question. Um, so thinking about uh, sustainability of these changes, will there be any longer term follow ups or continued research on these states um, that have done these efforts? None is planned and funded at the moment, but there are always opportunities. <laughs> uh, and I think as far as the uh, sustainability uh, and also thinking about the um, transferability to other states, uh, you know, I talked about all the different strategies states used and the changes that they made. Um, and other states can learn from those, can take those strategies, can, can make those changes. I think as um, Jennifer described, there was though something extra, the special bit about being part of WSS, having that, that grant and that external accountability that really helped them do what they wanted to do anyway. And so that I think is a, um, you know, that was great for WSS. I think that is the uh, even bigger challenge for sustainability and for um, transferability. And so I think, for one, it's an opportunity for uh, other funders to come in and give, you know, continue doing this in different um, guises. But I think it also could be um, recognizing that that external accountability and that little bit of external funding can be so important that a state that wants to do this could find ways to create that for themselves um, by reaching out to a funder or an external uh, entity to create that external accountability that will then help the state do what they want to do. An older project in a different area was the Shifting Gears Initiative, which was on workforce things, but again, it was a foundation-funded set of states working together quite intensely over a period of time. And there is like an evaluation report that's based on that eight years later, so that might be of interest to folks who are thinking about how this sort of initiative can set root and last. We Hello? Oh, we have a question from the live stream. Um, it says, how can we get connected to the learning community that was mentioned? Okay. So the live stream asked how um, they can get connected to the learning community that was mentioned. If you go to the CLASP website and just look in our general information, send us an email, we'll make sure you get on the list for information. CLASP is www.claspp.org. Any further questions? Are there any final parting thoughts you want to share with us? <laughs> I just speaking to the state administrators in the uh, administrators in the audience. This can be done. You know, I know it's very overwhelming to face what what folks face every day. But making a carving out a time each day, each week, whatever it might be, to focus on looking forward instead of just reacting to crises is critical. It inspires you. It inspires staff. And it takes a long time to make any change in state government. But that change can have such a huge impact on millions of people that it, it's worth carving that out. So if we can in any way, any way support that at Center on Budget, at CLASP, at Urban, feel free to let us know because it, it's worth the effort. There will be uh, one final WSS event on June 28th at the Urban Institute uh, where we will be bringing together a group of people, some from who are involved in WSS and some people less so, um, talking about the future and where do we go from here. Great. Well, join me in thanking our panelists for an engaging session.